This is episode 13 of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A.J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. That's gorilla with two R's and two L's. To support this project and get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash S.A.J. Johnson. If you've gotten this far, I hope you're enjoying it, so take a minute to tell a friend. If you've done that, please consider leaving this podcast a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And thanks. This podcast contains fleeting, explicit language. Chapter 28, 2.2.3, Education. Throughout human history, educational systems have been a reflection of their age. In feudal times, education was the purview of the wealthy and religious aesthetics. With the invention of the printing press, first in China and then Europe, knowledge became more widespread as the barrier to access was now literacy, although monetary or spiritual wealth were still important predictors of education. Following the Enlightenment came the Industrial Revolution and the need for a uniform workforce of moderately educated people. Just as the assembly line and specialization streamlined the production of automobiles, our education system became a factory produced good assembly line workers. Students learned from specialized teachers who taught the same class all day to different cohorts. Instead of encouraging creative thinking, the education system rewarded those who could most closely approximate an ideal. The most memorized facts, the most accurate math answers, the most reliable attendance. Schools trained students to perform repetitive tasks devoid of real-world applications, a necessary skill for the assembly line worker. Even the bells that signaled the day's periods foreshadowed factory whistles. For millions of years, humans and our ancestors have learned from the previous generation, but only in the last century have we had to suffer through an industrial education system. Hunter-gatherers learn by observation, trial and error, and one-on-one or small group instruction. As agriculture took hold and feudal systems grew, most of the population continued to learn in these ways. Even the social elites, who were literate in math, science, and literature, were taught by tutors. This model of education continued into the Enlightenment, where individuals and small groups continued to learn from teachers in a two-way exchange of ideas. Industrial education is a one-way affair. Knowledge flows from teacher to student through a one-size-fits-all syllabus. Humans, however, have evolved to learn in a two-way interaction on an individualized basis. We are not cogs that need to be shaped to fit into an industrial machine. Of course, it cannot be denied that industrialized education has resulted in the highest level of literacy and great advances in every scientific field. However, we contend that this correlation is not a causal relationship. Advanced education has always been the purview of the wealthy few. Even in the mid-1900s, the wealthy distinguished their status by sending their children to study subjects that cannot be of inherent use in an industrialized economy, such as ancient Greek and Latin. With a more broadly educated populace, however, those with a propensity to study were able to rise and realize their potential. It is not the type of education that is meted out in the industrial system that gave rise to our well-educated populace today, but the fact that it was open to everybody. Imagine then if we were all given a chance to learn in a way that better approximated how humans evolved to learn. As with the small-scale local autonomous communities discussed above, education might be reformed to provide an enriching experience without the industrial structure. Learning can be accomplished in small peer groups with students helping one another tackle lessons taught by a dedicated teacher, one who is well-versed in a variety of subjects. As students age and their interests become more focused, they might elect to study under a mentor with a specific expertise in a more narrow subject. This is not unlike a master-apprentice system, but as education would be open to everybody, not just the social elites, it would not engender the stark divisions of the feudal age. Of course, each community should experiment with education so long as everybody is able and encouraged to gain basic competency before moving on to further study or training in a chosen area. End of chapter. Chapter 29, Another Class, Spring 2015. All right, folks, let's wrap this up and start discussing the last project of the semester. I've been doing this one for years, and it's easily my favorite assignment. Jeff Childress, a professor in his late 40s with shaggy gray hair and glasses, stood in front of a class of 30 now groaning students. Ah, quit your belly aching. Most students end up putting down this project as their favorite part of the class, too. This semester, we've been studying population dynamics. We've traced how different social institutions and practices play out demographically. In the final two weeks, your challenge is to create the most beneficial human society using everything we've learned. Imagine that you're the benevolent dictator of the world. How would you engineer society? Dr. Jensen here will be handing out the assignment sheet. Eric hopped out of his seat and passed descriptions of the assignment down each row of tables. Students read through the pages as he moved through the room. Eric had been thinking about joining in the fun. This will be a group project. Uh, yeah, Eric? Can I propose a society as well? Jeff blinked at him. Ah, uh, I suppose that would be fine. Do you want to invite students to work with you? Eric surveyed the room of students. Yeah, that'd be great, but I want to warn you that I'm rejecting the 
premise of the assignment. I didn't realize I had proposed much of a premise, but more of a scenario. Sorry, let me ask then, what do you consider to be the most beneficial human society? Oh, oh, I see. Well, one that allows us to continue improving the human condition in terms of lifespan, comfort, education, and uh, scientific progress. Aha, that's the premise I'll be rejecting in my society. Since I am the benevolent dictator, I will decree that the most beneficial human society is one that coexists with other systems on the planet into the distant future. I'll be searching for a stable state existence, not an enhanced version of today's world. That is the society I will be proposing, and if some folks want to join me, I'd be delighted to work with them. Well, as long as it's well-researched and shored up by logical arguments, I won't hold your misanthropy against you or anyone who joins you. Students snickered, but three hands went up. Eric jotted down their names. The next day, two of the students had gathered in Eric's office. Spring had sprung, and the smell of fresh-cut grass and the shouts of students on the quad came through the window. So let me get this straight, said Ashley Coston, a senior in the Environmental Studies program. You're done with your degree, but can't find a job as a professor, so you're working as an assistant here? Eric shrugged. It's tough to assist in classes I've taught before as an adjunct professor, but what can you do? After the recession, universities cut budgets by using cheap adjunct labor to teach classes instead of hiring full-time professors. I graduated at the worst time in recent memory for social scientists. So what are you going to do after this? asked Jillian McGill, an anthropology major. Eric looked up at the ceiling, stalling. Well, <laughs> that's a good question. Oh, but now that Zurich's here, let's get started. Zurich Benavista, another anthropology major, hurried into the office looking sheepish and apologizing for being late. It's no big deal. The end of civilization is coming whether we're ready for it or not, said Eric to a few chuckles. Not if our new society has anything to say about it, Zurich said. Well, that depends. We should probably start at the beginning and decide what we want our society to achieve in the long term. Then we can create the system we want with those aims in mind. Ashley started to raise her hand and then pulled it down. Oh, sorry, force of habit. Uh, I am think I'm here because you mentioned sustainability when you interrupted Professor Childress. That's why I volunteered. Okay, said Eric. What does that mean to you? Well, um, we have to live and use resources in a responsible manner. That's pretty diplomatic and vague. Fossil fuel companies always talk about how they are responsibly using resources. Ah, drat. All right, human society has to learn to depend on renewable resources in the amount that they are renewed. Does that make sense? Maybe, said Zurich. Uh, I can steal the phrase Dr. Jensen. Eric. Uh, okay, Eric used in the class. Stable state. When it comes to renewable resources, we should use them so that we are kept in a stable state, not depleting or overpopulating. Eric threw up his hands. I have to confess, I did not come up with that phrase. I stole it from Kallenbach, who wrote the utopian novel Ecotopia. We might look into other utopian novels by Edward Bellamy and William Morris, but I'd encourage you to read them after you've gone a long way towards designing our society. Otherwise, you'll just want to copy their ideas. I do think, though, that stable state is a great name for our society, said Jillian. It has the word state right in it, and it encapsulates that where we'll probably come down on the question of population. Eric sighed. Why didn't I think of that? Okay, so we have a stable state of resources. What else? Since we're in a demography class, said Zurich, we might as well discuss how to deal with the question of population growth. Right, Jillian said. Dr. Childress really put the smack down on Malthus and any argument for artificially limiting the human population. For the most part, yes, said Eric, but there's plenty of room in the spectrum between pronatalist and antinatalist. Every country has some incentives or disincentives to population growth. What are the common threads we see when we see population growth? Usually it correlates with sedentary and developing societies, said Ashley. Jillian flipped through her notes. Often the societies where the women having many babies have a greater social distinction between men and women, usually with the men dominating. And often women, and to a lesser extent men, have less education, said Zurich, especially when it comes to reproduction and sex. For sure. What about examples from outside of class, said, asked Eric. For example, how does the U.S. encourage its citizens to have children, or discourage them for that matter? But it doesn't really, said Ashley. Not like China's one-child policy. You guys probably didn't notice when you do your taxes, said Eric, but the tax code gives a break to parents with a deduction for each child. Ashley's eyes widened. Oh, would public education be pronatalist because it removes most of the burden of education costs from the family and instead asks the state to pay? Yep. But, said Jillian, we don't provide free childcare, preschool, or even paid maternity or paternity leave in the U.S., nor do we give each family a box with baby stuff like they do in Finland, Ashley said. In France, they get a nurse that comes to lend a hand a few hours each week after the baby is born, said Zurich. The WHO rates the French health care system as the best in the world. We also have more insidious pronatalist policies in the U.S. Eric continued in response to their puzzled looks. If the local Planned Parenthood is forced to shut down... Jillian shook her head. Geez, I never thought of that as part of it. So things like 
tax incentives and free education are carrots, and then lack of access to abortion and lack of comprehensive sex education, access to birth control, and various social pressures, added Zurich, are sticks, both of which drive people to have children. Right, said Eric. So it isn't clean cut. I like what the late great comedian George Carlin said. Something like, if you're pre-born, you're great. If you're preschool, you're screwed. Sounds about right, said Zurich. So what types of policies would we enact to ensure a stable state population, Ashley asked. First, shouldn't it be tied to resource availability, asked Jillian. We should have an assessment of our current population and society's ability to feed and house its members. If it's able to do that now in balance with the environment, fine. We can keep up our current population. But I I don't know. We might have to bring the population down to be more in step with our resources. Right now, we produce enough food to feed everybody on the planet. It's just a distribution problem, said Zurich. True, Eric said, but remember, the food system is simplified by the availability of fossil fuels, which we haven't discussed yet, but are probably not part of any long-term solution. Everybody nodded. So we still might be able to support a fairly large population, but I wonder about cities. Oh, said Ashley, weren't cities... uh, What what did Dr. Childress call them? Julian shuffled through her notes. Demographic sinks. Right, demographic sinks, meaning they couldn't support themselves in terms of population and had to grow by attracting people from the countryside. Not to mention they cannot provide food or the other resources to support themselves on the land they occupy, said Eric. So we're going with no cities, asked Jillian. They seem too hard on the environment, Zurich said. At least large ones are. Plus, hold on, Eric turned to his computer. I was reading an article. Uh, Here it is. We can't effectively deal with thousands of people. We evolved in small groups with extended kin networks of a few hundred people, and we don't seem to do well with numbers that get too large. That makes sense, said Ashley. So we're looking at many small spread out communities, ones that are connected and interact with each other, but are largely self-sufficient, asked Jillian. That seems like a good direction for us to head, said Eric. End of chapter. Chapter 30, 2.3, Population The Earth's population ticks up every few seconds, as children are born at a faster rate than people are dying. The United Nations projects a leveling out of the global population around 11 billion people in 2100. Note, United Nations, 2015. End of note. In many of the industrialized nations, such as Japan, Italy, and Germany, populations are already in decline. In much of the global south and east, however, populations continue to grow. The number of people drawing on Earth's resources have become a favorite topic among those contemplating the most effective strategies to survive in a rapidly changing ecosystem. Just before the Industrial Revolution, Thomas Robert Malthus, 1766-1834, published his essay on the principle of population, which states that organisms reproduce faster than their resources and thus populations are kept in check through miserable outcomes, famine, war, and disease. Note, Malthus, 1998, originally published 1798. End of note. This fate can only be mitigated by lowering the birth rate through celibacy, delaying marriage, and moral restraint. In Malthus's view, runaway populations doom themselves to misery. It was their own moral failing. This idea might have remained harmless if it had not been adopted by the administrators of the British colonies, who refused to provide aid when their policies created famines in Ireland and in India. During the Irish potato famine, for example, the colonial administrators were exporting meat and grain from a poverty-stricken land while publicly stating that it was the profligate Irish who were reproducing beyond their capacity to feed themselves. This faulty, you-get-what-you-deserve mentality pervades many of the arguments for population controls. Spurred by books like Paul Ehrlich's Population Bomb, many influential groups advocate for population control. Note, Ehrlich, 1968, end of note. The Club of Rome states, quote, If the present growth trends in world population, industrialization, pollution, food production, and resource depletion continue unchanged, the limits to growth on this planet will be reached sometime within the next 100 years. The most probable result will be a rather sudden and uncontrolled decline in both population and industrial capacity. End quote. Note. Meadows et al., 1972, page 23. End of note. They call for a population around 4 billion people, realized through freely available birth control and an average of two children per couple. Their book, Limits to Growth, published in 1972, examines the interplay of population, agriculture, natural resources, industry, and pollution in great technical, if outdated, detail. While a more simplistic way to think of the interplay of these variables is with Ehrlich's I equals PAT equation, where the human impact, I, is equal to the size of the population, P, times the affluence of the population, A, times technology, T. 
While it's not safe to quantify such qualitative traits such as affluence and technology, it is a shorthand to see that the more affluent and technologically advanced communities can have a greater impact on the environment with the same amount of population. An obvious step towards curbing our strain on finite natural resources would be to limit populations, but this can approach dangerous territory, namely eugenics and state-defined family planning. We are emphatically against the draconian enforcement of population levels. It is undeniable that a small population will have less impact on its surroundings than a large one, if per capita use is held constant. On the other hand, if per capita use is reduced, a larger population can exist safely. It is not for a few people to make this decision, but rather it is something that must be decided by each community. Do you choose to spend finite resources equally among more people or fewer? We would advocate for a stable state population, but not by creating harsh enforcement mechanisms. Instead, we would rely on a well-educated population to decide that having a modest number of offspring is the right thing for themselves and their community. Across the world, we see a strong negative correlation between female education standards and family size. The more educated women are in a given society, the fewer children average families tend to have. The Blueprint for Survival has a well-thought-out approach, which includes a public education campaign about the relationship between population size, resource availability, and the quality of life, as well as complete and open access to family planning information and contraception. Note, Goldsmith et al., 1972, page 257. End note. Additionally, social pressure has a large influence on the size of families, and championing smaller families in communities and media would have an outsized impact. End of chapter. End of episode 13 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com.